All right, hello, and welcome back. Go Big Orange Friday on, you guessed it, a Friday afternoon. Ryan Shumpert of Rocky Top Insiders here, as he is at this time each and every week. Ryan, good afternoon, sir. How are you? Doing well. Doing well. Glad to be back on and glad to be talking a, a little football and basketball. And I'm glad that you are coordinated with your room, with I your know. color scheme. The blue and white just is just your that. deal. You're just blue and white everywhere. I got the Cubs hat to go with yeah. the... Cubs flag and then the Titan sweatshirt to go with the Titan flag. I like it. You coordinate. And then I we got did. up there in uh, the screen. Uh, I don't know where you are right now. Are you in Knoxville? Where are you, Jack? Yeah, I'm in Fort Sanders. Oh, he most is beautiful in... place on earth. The <laughs> many you're saying the most. Be... <laughs> you won't find a piece of trash in that neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. It's like the, Who doesn't love it's like the, the little resort where people live. It seems kind of creepy. That's basically what Fort Sanders is. The fort's a great place if to go with, uh, like my wife, for instance, and we walk through the fort because we would park sometimes over there for for football games, and she would just point at different things of like crazy, different crazy shit she saw in the fort, where she's like, "Oh, I remember." It. So this is where that guy died and got revived, <laughs> and just, like that's uh, that, that's that's walking through the fort. You never know what you're gonna see, but it's uh, it's a fun time. My favorite uh, fort story, it's like sophomore year, mm. Friday night, I was covering some, you know, doing something for Daily Times cover, I can't remember, some high school football game in East Tennessee, and then I went and picked up my roommate, you know, he'd been drinking somewhere at a friend's apartment in the fort, and there's that school, it's not even an elementary school, I'm not sure what it is, but there's some school in the middle of the fort, yeah. mm-hmm. and I had to I had to pull over by the school, and he jumped out and threw up in, in the yard of the school. <laughs> There you I, go. My favorite fort story is after Tennessee, Alabama. Um, mm. I mean, I think we all had a little fun after, on that night. And, uh, you know, just, just having my friend assist me and basically drag me through the fort back to his apartment. That's that's forever going to live in my brain is my favorite fort memory. Because it was from, like, all the way on one side to the other. So it was a total trip. But, yeah, fort has a lot of good memories. But you made it. That's how oh, it I made it. I made that's it. important yeah. thing. Nice and sound. My last four thing this year was like um, when I broke my foot and went to the Tennessee Florida game. I that's as far as I made it because we parked at the fort and I got. How did you not get dropped off? Huh? How could you not swing somebody into dropping you off? Well, this? it's a long story as to why the whole drop off situation did not go. Okay. Uh, look, get married, Ryan, and then talk to me. <laughs> like, get married Fair. and then talk to me. And I uh, I was walking as far as i could and we stopped at that uh asian restaurant and i just i gave up at at that corner i was like i am going to start breaking down crying and i can't do that as a 31 year old man so i we we have to stop this is where my journey ends i don't care if i have to stay here forever if i'm now just a fort creature but that is what's going to happen because my body cannot move any further than where i'm at but that's uh that's what happened the fort's a fun time it's a fun time. Um, speaking of Fort Sanders, Walter Nolan um, teasing. <laughs> no, but uh, Walter Nolan uh, teasing Tennessee interest in the portal. Ryan, you wrote about it on Rocky Top Insider. Um, over 50% or under under 50% that Walter Nolan is a Tennessee volunteer after the spring transfer portal. Well, I didn't write about it for one. Rick wrote, Rick, Rick oh, well, wrote Rick about, wrote about it. it. There you go. We did write about it. Okay. At this point, Walter Nolan at Tennessee, I'm not to, to believe it. And even if he does enter the portal, I think that'll be an NIL game. It was an NIL game coming out of high school. And who knows what his value will be after what was a, probably a solid but not great freshman season at Texas A&M. But mm. the way Tennessee has recruited there, the way Tennessee's already added Omar, Omar Norman Lott from Arizona State, I have a hard time thinking Tennessee would be one of or would commit nil wise what they would have to commit to, to get walter nolan even if he does in the transfer portal but nolan to this point has been it's been all about the drama so i'm gonna have to see any of that to really believe it jack what do you think uh brian hit the nail on the head it was an nil thing of course AM tennessee went down to the wire with him but he chose to go to aggie land and yeah if he transfers i don't see it being tennessee just because of the players they've invested in already there. It feels like they're already set. They don't need to bring in 
someone of that caliber. And yeah, with the whole Walter Nolan thing, it does feel like there's just been too much drama with this situation from the very beginning. So I don't, I, I see why Tennessee fans would think that and want that, but I don't think it's a big deal uh, that, it, you know, even if Walter Nolan started teasing Tennessee even more, I don't think it's going to happen. I, I wouldn't follow down that trail. I mean, if he opens the door, you have to do your due diligence. Like, he's just too Certainly. talented where you, like, if he opens that door in the spring, like, I think you have to. Even with Omar and Norman Lott and the group, the rotation that you have, you can't just go, well, we've got X amount of guys, so we, we can't. Well, there's no room for Walter Nolan. It's like, well, no, we, we watched the trenches and the Georgia game and some of the other bigger games. Like, no, there's room. <laughs> if Walter Nolan was to jump in the boat, like, hey, Walter Nolan, we can have a conversation about jumping in the boat. Um... I don't know. I just, I, he's like one of those guys too, that with Texas A&M, the, the styles are so different where Tennessee's speed and the rotation and just how many snaps he has to be like, I don't know if he would want to be a, uh, a part of what you have to do as a defensive lineman at UT and just kind of what is expected of the defense, because very different offense with A&M and how much you're on the field, uh, on it at A&M versus at, uh, at Tennessee, maybe it's different though by Petrino. Maybe they they do play with a bit more tempo, and it's a completely new look offense, and uh, it's more similar to what they're doing at Tennessee. You never know, but um, I do think it's interesting. It's something worth monitoring in just the portal era. That hey, uh, come spring, he might jump, uh, put his name in the portal. You get two weeks or whatever it is, and you just we got to see. I think it's something to monitor at the very least, right? Because there's more more of a track record, and it's like would he have gone to Tennessee if Tennessee was had the season that they just had a year ago. Like so, if he was in the twenty twenty three class, would he be a Tennessee volunteer right now? That's something that you would that you kind of wonder because of how much success they just had. Exactly, and how much success Texas A and M didn't have. I mean, they right. didn't make a bowl game. So mm-hmm. yeah, people forget that. Yeah, and they were what were they sixth in the preseason bowl? I yep. mean, I had them in the playoffs. Yeah, so did Desmond Howard. Yeah, so you and Desmond Howard both. <laughs> My thing, yeah. my reasoning was sound. My rationale was sound. You know, we're not getting into it. We're not getting into Texas A&M. They, they disappointed me. They're dead to me. They were almost in the playoff, what, three years ago? Two years ago in the 2020 yeah. season. They were. Yeah, they just season. missed the cut. Just missed the cut. Um, but we'll see. We'll see what happens with Walter Nolan and Texas A&M. But definitely something uh, worth monitoring um, just a little bit. Um, what do you know about the preferred walk-on at quarterback, Jack? Yeah, so I actually know him pretty well. He attended my high school, Henry yeah. High School, from Paris, Tennessee. Got to represent. Um, there you go. Yeah, so he shattered all of Henry County's records. He started all four seasons. Um, mm. Took a, took. I'm going to say us because it's my high school. He took us to the semifinal Class 5A um, game three years in a row. Um, mm. Took us to the quarterfinal in his freshman season. That was my final year in high school. I remember that loss. It was brutal to Dyer County. But – you know, last two years, took it to the semifinal, lost to Page both times. He's he's very talented. He's got a good arm. And Ryan and I mentioned this on the RTI podcast yesterday. That the only reason he probably wasn't as highly recruited is because of his height. He's sitting mm. at around 5'11", 5'10", 6 foot. In that range, he's just under 6 foot. Um, but, but he's talented. And um, it's nice to see someone follow their dreams because I've known he's always wanted to come to Tennessee. Had a scholarship offer from ETSU. Could have easily gone about an hour and change east but he chose to come to rocky top and you got to respect that yeah for sure and it, he's the kind of guy that i think ryan and i we were talking about like just tennessee was gonna have a hard time getting the kind of transfer quarterback who is just going to sign up for um being just the backup and not really having an opportunity to play because like you're even gonna have to fight for get to beat out guest and more who's been in this offense for years and um someone hype will obviously trust and that sort of thing and um it does feel feel a need and as jack said he does have a lot of stetson, stetson bennett in him like he's the the height the the accuracy just the high school accolades um stetson bennett 2.0 from jack foster but um ryan what do you make now the qb room do you feel better with this addition or are you still kind of eh, well we, they could still do more where are you at with the qb room with this addition yeah i still think they need another uh, another more experienced name or, or more experienced player i like i like to move a ton for the long term mm. aspects of it because of everything we talked about a few weeks ago where it's just going to be so hard to keep mo- three or more scholarship quarterbacks on your roster and i think having a guy like that who is committed to the program who is talented 
and having that option as a guy down the line, that's great. Mm. You can't expect this kid to be able to play as a freshman. You can't. That's that's asking way, way too much out, mm-hmm. out of him. Even if everything, you know, hits the fan, it's going to be gasping more over him this year. So I think in the short term, you, you still need to add somebody, see what's available after spring. Uh, that seems to be the option. But in the long term, he's the type of guy that you should almost be trying to find in at least every other class because mm. of all the – issues that every school in the country is going to have about maintaining quarterbacks and, and having a guy uh, like him, I think is really could be really beneficial down the line. And you never know if it's going to end up being something where he has to play or not, but I think there's certainly a sense of security in, in having someone like that in your program for four years. Yeah. yeah. This is also a guy who uh, went, to, I was going to say, I covered him covering um, two years ago. I covered the elite 11 just for my job. And then this past year it was Nico was there in Nashville and mm-hmm. Ryan Dameron was at the Elite 11 both of those times. And uh, the first year I was there, he actually impressed. And in the class of 2023, 20, that class that they had, the younger group, he actually mm-hmm. placed in the top three at that tournament. So he impressed as a junior in high school there at that tournament. And then he did pretty well this past year as well. So, you know, he's a guy that's done camps, that's been around, that has a lot of experience. Cam Newton, seven on seven, he's done that. So mm-hmm. he has a lot of experience under his belt, you know, more than just high school quarterback. It is interesting too. It's like everyone was just like really good player, and if he's like three inches taller, then he's got a real shot right. of playing. And it's like, well, I don't know. Stetson Bennett, five ten, five eleven. We've seen guys like that. Maybe uh, you never know. Uh, high upside. You you put him in the disciple offense for a couple of years to learn and that sort of thing. You never know. Um, obviously, a lot's gone wrong if he's played this year. If if <laughs> if he's getting some snaps this year, then a lot has gone wrong for Tennessee. But I don't know. I still. I think it's kind of odd the way that a lot of folks still talk about the Tennessee quarterback room and like why it's gonna be hard to get like one guy in the uh, in the portal this year where it's like the Nico factor. But I'm like, if you're a grad transfer quarterback, still I I don't know. We we just saw it. Like we just saw this with Hendon and Joe, where it's like, are you certain that they would go with a true freshman over you if you were a grad transfer who had a lot of production in the past? And like, if Joe struggles, do you really think that you can't beat out Joe Milton in the spring? Because it's going to be an open competition. I don't know. I think that's been kind of strange to me that that has been a thing. That was kind of one of the weird things to me about Taven was, and that I might write about this this weekend, but um, it's just, I think there's more opportunity uh, than a lot of folks are letting on. And I think it, it being an open competition, and I really do think it's open, I think the hope with Nico is him not to play. So if you're a grad transfer, you only need one year to ball out in Heupel's offense to get a serious look at the NFL draft. I still think this is an attractive spot if you're only looking for a one-and-done, um, just high-octane, high uh high efficient year i mean we just saw what lane kiffin did in Ole miss like he brought in a couple of those guys to compete knowing that you don't (laughs) there's nothing settled here and you're gonna if you are starting in my offense you're gonna put up numbers i think tennessee should be able to sell the same thing so i've just kind of pushed back against that narrative that it's gonna be hard because i'm like he goes down the road i think you can get an older player to compete with joe in the spring and summer um because you've already seen it joe lost the job already uh two years ago like if you're a really good player you should believe that you can beat out joe milton for this job yeah, I'm not <laughs> sure. I, I agree with much of what you said. <laughs> I mean, I, I why you're saying? Well, you mentioned the Ole Miss situation. They took the young guy, they yeah. got him signed, and then the next day later, they added the, the senior. Who? I mean, they played the game extremely well. It's a yeah. classic. Mislead the young guy and then bring in the old guy and, who can have that one year. And Walker Howard's not Joe Milton. Walker yeah. Howard's not Nico Iamaliava. So to me, it's I guess your logic I think is decently sound but i think when you apply it to the specific pieces out there uh i'm just not sure you're gonna find many people that are gonna take that risk and maybe yeah. i'm wrong maybe maybe there is someone out there that has supreme confidence in themselves that would but especially at this point yeah you know, the, the top guys are already gone doesn't it just feel like tennessee and joe milton are too far down the road for hypo to add a grad transfer and then start him potentially like I, I just feel like this relationship is too far down the road for Milton to get beat out by another dude in his final year of eligibility when Milton himself is in his final year of mm-hmm. eligibility. Like, this is Milton's chance. And I feel like Tennessee is going to give him that chance, and I feel like yeah. he knows that, and it's mutual, right? Like, Nico's going to be there to add a little push. But if they add somebody, I don't I don't think it's a big name that has one more year that could really compete for a starting job. I think it would just be for depth purposes. 
if they add a transfer portal guy. Um, and, you know, you look at what Michigan did last year, what Ole Miss did last year with Altmeyer and Dart. Michigan did it with McNamara and McCarthy to start the two quarterbacks. Like, you this drive, you this drive, or you this game, you this game. Tennessee's not going to do that. that. That's just not how I see them rolling. So I, I don't feel like they're going to add somebody, a grad transfer, to potentially take the starting job. And I, I to Jack's point, they're so far down the road with Milton, and they've put so much confidence from exactly. the time that Hendon passed him and Milton decided to come back that we think he can be the guy. We think mm-hmm. we can develop him, and in 2023, he can be the guy. And with the trust and faith that locker room has in him, it's why I don't. they can talk all competition all they want. Joe Milton's the starter when they head to the National to play Virginia next year. And if Joe Milton plays poor enough, that he loses that starting job, which I think all of us know that that's at least a possibility. How big a possibility? I'm not sure. Tennessee loses games early in the season that gets Joe Milton out of the job. The goals, the aspirations of making playoff, that's done. Let's move on to the future and get Nico reps. That's what that's that's what that's going to be. It's not going to be let's turn to a senior now mm-hmm. and see if we can scrape eight and four together. It's going to say, all right, we'll take our lumps with Nico. Let's have him ready to roll in 2024 and see if we can make a 12-team playoff in the first year. I just don't want to throw him in the in the fire. Like, if he's having to enter the game for a non-injury-related situation, then the season's not going well. And that means there's a lot more pressure, and Tennessee fans are getting antsy. It's year three for Heupel. I just, maybe it's just me and, like, what I've seen from Joe Milton to this point where I'm like, I don't feel good about the quarterback room and the quarterback situation next year at Tennessee being uh, bet on Joe Milton. And then if things don't go well, then true freshman Nico Yamaliava, um, just trying to keep things afloat down the stretch here. Like, I don't I don't feel great about it. I, I think it's it's a little more risky than I think uh, some folks may uh, anticipate with this fall because we still I mean, Joe is fine in the orange ball. He was fine. But this offense is going to struggle to score points a little bit. I think it's not going to be as seamless as what how Hendon made everything look. And Hendon was just so good with his legs. And Joe was still kind of a statue in the pocket. And we'll see if he does more stuff on third down to extend drives. I mean, he took there was a lot of three and outs in that Orange Bowl. And if you go back through and watch it, like it's just going to be more clunky. Like he'll have those squirrel white bombs, and you'll still have the explosive plays next year. But I think it's going to be a lot more clunky of an offense and more more pain um, watching this offense. And we haven't seen it like I, I joke with Ryan Jack on this show because like I like go to these games and sit uh, in the stadium and Harrison Bailey chants were insane when Joe Milton started uh, two years ago. Like everything around me, people were just screaming to get Joe out of there. With Nico now in the fold, who is a, a little bit more of a big name than uh, Harrison Bailey, I don't think folks and even the coaching staff can be ready for this, or Joe can be ready for this, of just how insane the fans are going to be when it comes to Nico. He is the number one on three quarterback now. Everyone knows exactly who Nico is in Knoxville. Like I, whenever I see him in Knoxville, fans and kids are like stopping him for photos like he is already a superstar like Nico Yamaliava is the most known Tennessee player on this team right now and he has not played a snap he is the Nico chants are going to be insane they are going to be brutal to this kid um to get him in the game sooner rather than later and I mean you can say all the right things because it's the off season of like Joe is our guy Joe is gonna be fun and all the fans are like we back Joe because like we all like Joe like I have nothing against Joe I hope he does well. That'd be great. He's like in the top 15 in Heisman odds preseason. Great. Like, I hope all that happens. I hope this is the breakthrough year for Joe. But he is like, this is a totally different ball game with Nico now behind him. And if that's your only, like Ryan's talking about where it's like, that's just kind of, if Joe doesn't work out, then it's a rebuilding year and we just got to get Nico reps. I just, I think there's going to be an unbelievable amount of pressure on Joe and Hypo and this staff this year because the Nico conversation and these fans are going to be relentless whenever Joe struggles. A hundred percent. I think everything you said is right. I think if you're a hundred percent bought in to Joe Milton being great, like that would be foolish. It, it yeah. really would be. But I think, and that's why I wrote about it when the transfer portal opened, regular season was over. Tennessee should go after a quarterback. Yeah. And Spencer Sanders was the guy I, I thought Tennessee should go after, but obviously yeah. it didn't happen. And, I've said it since the time Nico committed that I felt bad for Joe Milton because he was so hated, so, yeah. so hated in 2021, especially when he ran out of bounds in that last play against Ole Yeah, So hated. And he worked himself back into good graces by being a good teammate, by 
frankly, being friends with Hendon Hooker, honestly. Yeah. honestly. Wait, and did you know that? They were roommates. <laughs> they cook. They have dogs. Mm-hmm. Anybody, mm-hmm. anybody know? And then you're absolutely right. The first time he struggles next year, everyone's going to be screaming for Nico. Yeah. Where I think your point, where I think it's going to be different and maybe the pressure is a little bit, not off Milton, but off Heupel, they won 11 games this year. Since yeah. you went 9-3 and three last year, you're right. There'd be a lot more pressure to have a good season. I think most people are going to be, if it does end up being a rebuilding year, and you don't bottom out, you go 8-4, and four, I think people are going to be understanding enough. That doesn't mean people won't be screaming for Nico because that's just the reality of what it's going to be with Tennessee fans. But I think there will be enough confidence in what Heupel is doing, enough confidence in Heupel that n- things aren't going to bottom out. Being, the crap's not going to hit the fan per se. So right. to me, that's where I think it's almost a completely different conversation and Heupel would have to play it differently if they didn't have such su- supreme success on the field this past season. Yeah, I mean, if if your expectations for Tennessee this season are to make the CFP or to win 10, 11 games again, then I could see a scenario where it really starts to become a burden for Josh Heupel with the fans calling for Nico and stuff. But Don't I we think like fans most, think that? I think most fans are expecting, like, that should be where maybe we're at. Maybe a 10-win season, yeah. but, like, to win the East, is if that's your expectation. Mm. I don't think there's... No, yeah, I don't. I don't feel like there's that's a lot... reasonable expectation for... I don't feel like that's what the consensus is. My gut is it's a rebuilding year. I don't know if that's the media. All, it seems like the media think it's a rebuilding year. And then I'll like text my family and they're all like, uh, we better be in the playoff next year. Like, we better keep building. And I'm like, I think there's a oh. disconnect in how Tennessee fans see. They're like, we won 11 games this year. We got a great recruiting class. That should help the depth. We did really well in the portal. We should keep this thing humming. Like, we should now win 12 games next year. Like, that's, uh, they just think it's like, it's, um, uh, what am I blanking on the word? Um, that linear. Uh, why am I blanking? Why am I blanking? Is linear. Linear. Yes. There you go. That it's just the the progress yeah, is linear. Of, that now you did Jesse's, this, so then you go this. That's where a lot of fans are. Slope. Great Jesse Simonson line. Yeah. Progression is not linear in college football. No, but fans don't see it that they, way. Yeah. No, you're right. But I, I don't think even the, no, they not the wildest. But even the most optimistic fans, I think. 10 and 2 is what they yeah. see. I don't think it's 11 and 1. What does your gut tell you right now? I'd be not I guess 9 and 3. Eight and okay. 9 and 3 would be my would be my prediction. Is here. Joe starting every one of those games? Yeah, I, I'll go I'll go if yes. Okay. And, and yes. I do think one thing that's important to look at is the schedule softer. It, yeah. it just it's it's a soft schedule. I mean I would say it's off. I think it's harder than last year. I do too. Maybe do you? Jack and I are on the same page. I think it's harder than last year. You go to Florida this time. Yeah, your layups aren't as easy, and you go to Florida and Bama. You go to Kentucky too, who I think is gonna be better. Get A and M at home. To me, that's a much much easier game than going to LSU. I know you're a big A and M guy over there, Chase. You love you. (laughs) No, you're right. That is easier. I mean, that's easier. But but you're non-conference. UConn's good. UConn just went to a bowl. Like that's gonna be uh, like, hey, they should beat UConn. You go to Mizzou. You should beat Mizzou. You get Georgia at home, which is good. But you got to go to Alabama. That's just like, go ahead and pencil that one in. That's a loss. But at Kentucky and Bama back to back, it's just that's a lot. Um. Me, South Carolina the is the one table. that I would just go ahead and say. I think they beat South Carolina by 40 plus, but like that's just. Yeah, they get the them person. early this time. Oh my Shane God. Shane Beamer's only good late. Also, why does that game switch? Why is it when it's in South Carolina, Tennessee plays them at the end of the year, and then when it's <laughs> in the beginning of the year, it, they have to play at Tennessee? Why do they do that? I've also already analyzed the SEC schedule that week and uh-huh. the theme of every single time Tennessee goes to Columbia it being a night game and every single time it's in Knoxville it being a noon game is going to yeah. continue. It's it's going to be – it's not going to be a primetime game. It's, it's Which a is good. SEC, it's SEC slate. It's going to be hot. It, it's going to be, once again – I mean, it's genuinely unbelievable. Tennessee yeah. – at home in Elon Stadium against South Carolina, it refuses to be a good good game time for the home team, and it's <laughs> mm. night game every single time it's in Columbia, which probably yeah. just goes to your point that it's later in the year, and that's usually how it lines up. the The schedules are a little bit the SEC schedules are softer then, and you don't have as nearly as good many good matchups as you do whatever it is this year, the first week of October, yeah. you know, last week of September. Also, Virginia would be a little bit better. It's the neutral site; you should beat them. But like at Florida is a toss up. At Kentucky, like I think they split those. I don't know. I think they beat Kentucky, but at Florida, I 
uh, I don't feel great about it. Like I think that's a that's one of those where that's when the Joe Milton stuff will start. And then UTSA yeah. is a really good Group of Five team, a really good one that you play right after that at home. Like I don't know. I think the schedule's harder. I think there's really not a lot of give me's outside of Austin P. I think even the ones that Tennessee should be favored and be fine. I think we'll just they're good they're good teams. Like they're just gonna have to beat a lot of good teams to get to nine and three. Stop the UConn man. talk right now. I'm UConn, sorry. They went I bowling. Can't you guys? I can't I can't sit Come here on. And, take, and take us seriously if we're gonna act like UConn has a chance to come to the Elite State. I'm not saying they come a chance to I'm win. Sorry. I am not doing that. I am not saying they have a chance to come and win. I'm just saying it's another good team on the schedule. I am saying UConn is a good football team now. Jim Mora has turned that ship around. That's all I'm saying, is he's turned it around. Like they're not a dumpster fire coming into New York. They're not a dumpster fire, but there's a big difference between dumpster fire and good. And yeah, I'm not just hold on. They're good they're hey, they're fine. They hung with Marshall. They're they're fine. There you go. I'll give you their fine, but don't sit here. And UTSA is like good. You did six times. UTSA UTS- is good. Completely agree with that. Mm. That's I don't like thing. it. Like UTSA Especially right after Florida. Thing. You can sell me on, on UTSA being a really tough game, bad spot. I'll buy all of that. Can I give you? I'm going to go ahead and say talk. Joe doesn't last past UTSA. What? I don't think he lasts past UTSA. I think that's, that's where he gets hit. Is the UTSA Florida game like that back to back? Where if Tennessee drops Florida and Joe plays poorly, and then he struggles in a shootout against UTSA, and like UTSA is balling out, and Joe like the Nico chance for UTSA in the stadium, I can't wait for that one. I've just talked myself. This is what's happening. I just I've already seen it. All right, I I called the schedule 100 percent last year. Ryan can attest to this. I said 10 and two. Yeah. They what, a dumb loss to South Carolina, and they would split Georgia and Alabama. That's what I called last year. I think this year it's like seven and five. And I think UTSA wow. fans turn. It's 100% where you drop the Florida game and it's another close, terrible game. And Joe, it's a bad ending. And fans are like, oh, my God, this is not happening all over again. And then the next week you get UTSA at home and you're like, oh, crap. They don't even get a cupcake to bounce back. They get UTSA who comes in and scores 45. And Joe has to just survive in a shootout and he can't do it. So then they have to put in Nico to beat UTSA at home. I don't think he makes it through UTSA, wow. and then it's Nico from the rest of the way. That's I don't even bold. think I, it's bold, but I I don't think it's like unfathomable. Like I can I can completely see that playing out where you see struggles at Florida, mm. and I, I feel I have such a dilemma on the Florida game because man, am I low on Florida's football team next year? I am like I'm I'm low on everything outside of the Tennessee game. Like I just think ten, like yeah, Tennessee, Tennessee at Florida Tennessee is just game, Tennessee at Florida. How could you? Tennessee at Florida, Joe Milton in his first big start. Yep. How could you feel like complete confidence? So I'm with you there. And if you lose that game, I could 100% come back, let down spot against UT, a good UTSA team, and he struggles early. Like I, they got like a seventh year quarterback, Frank Harris. <laughs> like yes. I, he's gonna play better than Joe, and I think it's just gonna people are gonna lose their minds when the Roadrunners are up like 17-7 at the half, and we're like, oh my god, what are we doing? What are we doing, hype? What are we doing? Yeah, I, I, don't I, I, don't, I don't think that's crazy. I, really, I don't think it's an insane take by him. Okay, my thing is, what has Joe Milton done to create this pessimism? Well, he hasn't. Like, I mean, what's what? <laughs> Ryan is just Ryan. What? What? I, what is this a, is I mean, did I watch the same Orange Bowl that y'all did? Yes, he was fine. He was, he was fine. He was pretty good. And yeah. He blew. He blew me and Chase's expectations out of the water. Yeah. But he's got seven. Six, I don't know how many games he started in Michigan. Yeah. He's got seven other starts in his career where he was bad. Yeah. I don't know. The majority of what we've seen from Joe Milton is not good. Yeah. I agree. Yes, definitely. But what you've seen I, recently. I, I, that was a bowl like, game. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, like big being here talking, I like talking with Chase because he makes me look like a Joe Milton believer. And sometimes I feel too <laughs> negative. About, I feel like I'm too negative about Joe Milton. Then I get here on here and talk about Chase. And okay. I'm like, Maybe I'm pretty high on Joe Milton in comparison. I'm gonna send in a request to, for uh, Bill Martin. Be like, hey, can I get Joe? And he's like, absolutely not. You're you're on the permanent block list for Joe Milton. Like, absolutely not. And it's not even that. It's like I just, it's not. He's not making it. Like any Tennessee fan, like the Heisman stuff. You're just throwing money away. If you put any money towards Joe Milton for the Heisman odds, like ooh, plus two two thousand or whatever it is, you just burned some money. Like it's not happening. Tennessee's not going three for three in the quarterback market like this. Like you don't see that very often of just like Alabama where they just, it doesn't matter who's under center. They're going to be fine. I don't think that's the case. 
uh, with Tennessee. It's just Joe Milton is an amazing story that everyone walks on eggshells. Like, I don't like talking about it with other Tennessee fans at this point because the first thing people say is, man, he's such a good teammate. Like, he... <laughs> and I'm like, that's... Hen is gone. Like, what are we doing? Like, it, I, I get that. I, you can root for the person and, like, feel... He's a feel-good story, but, like, what have you actually seen? Like, let's bypass that beginning part of the conversation of, hey, he's a good teammate, and, like, he's... And he's he was just really good for Hendon and was a good sounding board. And when Hendon had questions and wanted to watch film, he would he would go do it with Hendon and that sort of thing. And they were good for each other. It's like okay, got all that, but what have you seen? Like he still ran out of bounds against Ole Miss. He's still, I mean, the deep ball shots. Like he he was struggling um, in the Orange Bowl. Like he had a couple, but like I was talking about earlier, like you go back and watch. There's so many where he took some bad sacks. Um, he had a lot of three and outs. He it's not the Hendon efficiency. Like Hendon was just a totally different Heisman level quarterback. And I just think Hendon's a much better player than Joe. And I think it's just it's gonna fall off. Like I, I the offense is gonna fall off and I don't know if Tennessee fans like I'm not saying it's gonna go from like first in the nation in scoring to like thirty seventh, but do I think it'll probably go from like first to like twentieth with Joe? Somewhere around there? Yeah. And Tennessee fans are gonna get antsy. I think what will be interesting to see from Tennessee this year is how much more they lean on the run game because yeah. all three top backs are coming back. And mm. They're all I think they have, have to. great years. Yeah, and I, I think Josh Heupel's offense will switch more towards not necessarily a ground and pound offense, but they will run the ball more, and I think they'll run it well. Yeah, yeah, I, that's exactly what I was about to say, and I think that's one thing that when you talk about Chase, the lack of sustained drives in mm. the Orange Bowl, that comes to defense, and that comes to run defenses. You know, Tennessee's not going to see too many better next season. Mm. I mean, they'll probably see a couple. But Tennessee is going to be able to sustain – they're going to have to, granted. But I think they're going to go to sustain drives a lot a lot more running the football than they did in that Orange Bowl game. I mean, it'll you know it'll be somewhere in the middle of what they did in the Vanderbilt game where they could run the ball for 30 yards of play, seemingly, in, yeah. in the Orange Bowl. But I do think that will go a long way in sustaining drives. And to Jack's point, I think – how well Tennessee can run it consistently is going to be extremely, extremely important because you can't back to your point, Chase, you can't put, you cannot put it on Joe Milton expected to be like in and hooker. And I think Josh Heifel and the staff understands that. That's the thing that might be the, in the second point um, that y'all bring up, because I think the way to get around the Joe Milton stuff is the wrong game to be amazing. Like if Jalen Wright and Dylan Sampson are both just running all over folks and they just make the leap in both ways. I mean, that does help. That does help a lot, but um, we'll see. We shall see. Um, Tennessee, they finally hired a uh, tight ends coach, and he was already on the staff as an offensive analyst uh, this whole time. Um, they had another coach on the road recruiting for uh, the tight end spot. Uh, there's people like Deuce Robinson still out. Um, you're wondering for months if it was going to be Jeff Ferris, would it be Seth Luttrell, um, would it be an outside guy? The focus was recruiting, 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 and that's not where they went they went in-house former offensive lineman for uh hypel at mizzou um alec how do you pronounce his last name abilin is it just abilin that's what i think but i'm not, okay. I'm not positive either yeah I, I haven't heard anyone say it with confidence alex abilin gets promoted to tight ends coach um the early response from a lot of uh, other media folks has been why was he not on the road for the last month if this was where you were always going to go why do we take so much time Earlier in the offseason, you promoted Joey Halsley, which was a done deal uh, where they said like it was known, I think, before the Orange Bowl that he was going to get promoted to the OC spot. So that was already known. If the same was true with Alec, then why was he not just why not just do it together? Why not do it right after each other? If that's what your plan was at all, just the order of operations did not make sense for how this was rolled out. And I think if you're like it's one thing to promote Kelsey Pope and he's been fantastic uh, filling in for Cody Burns, but we've seen this all over the sport where when you promote this much from within, like mm, it doesn't usually go well. Like someone's going to get fired from this group. And I, I think eventually you have to still have some outside people in there. And I understand from the offensive side of the ball that Hypo wants to be protective of his offense and go with guys he trusts. But I don't know. I think for me, this is one of the first hires that makes me a little anxious about um, how they're going about recruiting and how they're going about building out the staff once they get picked off um, by other universities, because I, I don't think this is sustainable um, what they're doing right now. 
and we'll see how he recruits. But if <laughs> Jerry Mack is not an elite running back recruiter, um, Kelsey Pope, I think at this point deserves is probably the best recruiter on the offensive side of the ball. Positional coaches, I think he's better than Glenn Ellery, and I think he's better. Um, and we just haven't even seen Alec. Like he hasn't recruited at all yet. So you have a good running backs coach in Jerry Mack, but not necessarily like an elite. Uh, running back recruiter in that regard and then you have Kelsey Pope who I think uh, is well on his way and we'll see especially with this 2024 class uh, who he's able to reel in because it seems like there's going to be at least one five-star wide out who ends up in Knoxville this this time around but like I don't know um, Joey Hall is a good recruiter um, but I, I I am a little bit more nervous about the staff going forward with this hire and i'm a little nervous about why it went this way in the hiring so i'm a little i'm a little dubious of how the order of operations went here and if this was kind of a a subtle disaster of an offseason on the coaching front uh ryan is that a little bit too too harsh yes i basically agree with everything you said okay i wouldn't go to the extent of disasters Mm. um puzzling he wasn't on the recruiting trail. Yeah. But, I mean, you mentioned Deuce Robinson. Tennessee's not, Tennessee's not getting Deuce Robinson. So no. it's not like they're – you were attacked, you were going hard after the, some tight end, and you don't have your tight ends coach out on the road recruiting. To me, puzzling doesn't really add up. But to me, I agree with – it's the process of it, and well, it's just the thought process behind promoting them. We've talked about it on here a couple times where, to me, this is a, a – a recruiting needed to be a recruiting hire that should have been number one most important thing i don't you know he's hype was so protective of his offense and wants guys in there to understand the scheme and obviously this is another guy that played for him but it's a tight ends coach mm. it's a tight ends coach recruit and josh heifel has done really well win at the elite elite levels you got to start recruiting at the yeah. elite elite levels yeah. that doesn't mean you have to be number one recruiting class right up there with georgia and alabama but you need to do what lsu did this year where you're not yeah. far behind you're four or five and hypo i think is recruited better than a lot of people expected probably better than i even expected and it's not like i'm panicking on what he him and his staff can do there but there feels to be to me and I don't even know if I want to go out there. And just, it, it has a little bit of a Dan Mullen vibe. Of, I was thinking the same thing. We, I'll out scheme. Mm. Good players, but we don't need great ones. And I'll out scheme us to a lot of wins. And Josh Heupel, I think, is a phenomenal coach. And I think he can out scheme a lot of people with good yeah. players to 10 wins. He's not going to out scheme. He's not going to out scheme Kirby Smart to consistently yeah, we saw it. him year in and year mm. out. Right. It's just not going to happen. You win. You, it's the. The X's and O's are great, but the Jimmy's and Joe's winning national championships. And mm. I think they're a little bit of a reluctance for Hypo. It feels like he's staying in his, his trust tree in his comfort yeah. level a little bit right now. And he's earned enough trust that I'm not going to go to the extent of calling it disastrous or just hammer him over it. But I do think I wouldn't have gone in that direction if I was him. And I think it's all about knowing your blind spots as a coach especially the head coach when you're running an organization as big as an SEC football program. And I think maybe Heupel is missing that a a little bit in this hire. Yeah. You'd like to see some, you know, I'd see him change it up, right. With him hiring these coaches. I mean, we've seen two, um, you know, inside hires, if you will, already with Pope and Halsley one, we'll see how that happened or how it works out in this one as well. Ablin, by the way, is how you Mm. pronounce the last name. Ablin. Found the pronunciation on the website. So there we go. Like Ablin. But yeah, I would have liked to see a little mixture here of how he conducts his hires. But I don't think it's, like Ryan said, it's not disastrous. And this tight end position, there was no big recruit they were trying to land or anything. We'll see how it goes on into next year. They got a lot of good tight ends coming in with um, Ethan Davis and the Bacallan Castle. So we'll see really how this group pans out this year. But, you know you just don't want Hypo to be too stubborn with these type of things. So we'll just have to see how it goes. And I, I didn't have a problem with either of those first, you know, two promotions. The receivers in that room absolutely love Kelsey Pope. I mean, Kelsey Pope's the home run here. Uh, like that was yes. like the clearly like the right decision to do there. And Halsley is coordinator. like, yeah, you shouldn't be worried about recruiting. You should be worried about a guy that knows your system and can run it well. And I like the fact that Hypo's going to call plays next year and he's going to 
build Halsley into that role. They're just felt with this hire, the way it drew out so long and for yeah. so long, they weren't even interviewing people. It just, it, he seemed distant. He seemed disinterested to make the hire yeah. and cool. disinterested to make a radical change. And again, you gotta know your blind spots. I think in spots you have to push yourself out of your comfort zones. And to me, this was the perfect spot to do it. Cause and he's, and he's been good at, you know, relinquishing control on the defense and putting trust in those assistants. Yeah. So I don't want to act like he's some control freak. But over the offense, this felt like a, a great spot to get somebody else in. It's not an overly important coaching position and to really focus on recruiting. And again, this is not that this staff doesn't have, you know, Southern ties. Obviously, Rodney Garner is the best recruiter in the last 30 years in the Southeastern Conference. But there are still, and especially on the offensive side of the balls, ball, not a ton of guys with SEC experience, not a ton of Southern ties. Obviously, Jerry Max from Memphis, but has never coached in the SEC before. And I think you missed an opportunity uh, to add somebody like that to the staff. Yeah, I agree. I, I just, I think it's going to be very, very interesting to see how this group re uh, recruits. Cause there's going to, they're going to be under a microscope. And like you said, Heupel deserves benefit of the doubt because of the season he just had. But if recruiting does dip a little bit and Tennessee does not build off on the offensive side of the ball, if they don't build off uh, these wins and what they did this last one and they don't catch they don't have the blips where they get into that LSU the LSU zone right or the Florida zone or beat Florida one year and I mean it's always gonna be hard to beat LSU in Florida um, and Georgia and Bama like those are the big four that are always gonna be tough for Tennessee to beat and they were right behind those four and it's like if you're a Tennessee fan I think most Tennessee fans get it right like they get it if you finish behind those four most years but you have to have some years where you beat at least two of them and that's uh I don't know. We'll see uh, on the on the recruiting front how this all unfolds, but I am a little dubious uh, with the recruiting ties uh, in the South, like you uh, outlined here about um, the offensive talent and just the Dan Mullen is uh, not the personality, but the Dan Mullen vibe. Like yeah. I'm probably the best schemer, and I I'll turn all these good players into great players. And it's like the offensive line recruiting has not been great to this point. Like we, <laughs> it's just not. And this class has like Sham. Hopefully, will be great, but. They're relying a lot on the portal. Both uh, tackles this year might be portal guys. Their yeah. right guard's going to be a portal guy. Like, that has to change. Like, Gun Elbery can be a good coach, but this is why the tight end hire could have been a recruiter. It is someone who could help in that in that room and help land some of these important uh, tackles. And part of the issue is that the state of Tennessee doesn't have a lot of five-star tackles in it. And they have to go into Georgia. They have to go to North Carolina or Bama or wherever. And if you don't have any guys with those kind of ties... I mean, I just think you're going to run into some problems closing the deal on a lot of these guys. So I don't know. We'll see. I mean, I, I'm cautiously optimistic, but um, I think at the very least, it's something that to monitor over the next year, uh, especially on the offensive line front, because if they don't land some more big names in the offensive line category, then it's like we have a serious problem because then it's back to back years. And then it's like you've kind of hit a wall where if you really want to compete with the Georges and the Bamas year over year. This cannot be the the offensive line uh, recruiting that you're putting together year over year. Speaking of recruiting, uh, Jordan Marshall visited again. Uh, would be a big get uh, if Tennessee can land him. He made, made the the balls made the top four for him. Um, Jack, do you think Tennessee will continue to struggle to land top running backs each year, or do you think Marshall could signify a change in how running backs view Heupel's offense and playing in this offense? Yeah, I mean, obviously this would be a big lane, and I think this year is going to be very telling. I mentioned mm -hmm. it earlier. We'll see how much they run the ball this year. I think it'll be a lot more than what we've seen in the past, but we kind of saw it at the end of last year too, them really leaning on the running game, and now that they have three good backs, I feel like this year will be really good for them to show high school running backs and recruits that, hey, we can do it both ways. You know, we're not going to be a total air raid offense. We are balanced. We will run the ball. We will – and by the way – Jamari, Jamari Small, the amount of rushing touchdowns he's had in this Josh Heupel offense, it's one of the most underrated stats of this offense. So they're not afraid to run the ball, and I feel like the Stored Marshall thing would be a big get, obviously, and would be a good um, a good stepping stone, if you will, towards being able to recruit running backs at a high level. For sure, for sure. Um, should – this is the last football thing I want to ask. So, Ryan, I was thinking about this because I was listening to the Audible with Stu and um, – and uh feldman feldman yeah i was playing on his first name uh feldman and bruce 
like uh, not a lot of bruce's out there and i was like bruce doesn't sound right when <laughs> it's just feldman um not a lot of stews either uh, in college football not yeah. a lot of stews and bruce's um but either way they were talking about tennessee and um just where recruiting is going with them and stuff like that and i'm curious from your perspective it, should tennessee fans if they build this like lincoln riley like if that's the best case scenario lincoln riley's ou where they they had the benefit of playing the big 12 so they made more uh cfps because of that but like if that was the best case scenario for Tennessee under Hypel, should Tennessee fans be happy with a souped up Lincoln Riley, Oklahoma? For a decade, at least. Yeah. I mean, at some point you get tired of it and mm. you have to take a risk and push to get to the next level. But from where Tennessee's been in the last 15 years and the fact that the playoff is expanding, even in the SEC, and I do, and I do think Tennessee's going to be better defensively obviously there's always going to be defensive limitations when you're running the type of offense that tennessee is but tennessee i mean that's the most impressive part of their 2023 recruiting class they recruited defense side of the ball really well mm. probably even more impressively than offensive side of the ball when you look at some of their short shortcomings at running back and, and on the offensive line so yeah i i think tennessee fans should be good with that for a while and i think in an expanded playoff if tennessee turns into lincoln riley oklahoma they're going to make playoff eight to 10 years. And mm. I think they'll struggle to just like Lincoln Riley did maybe knock down that wall and make it to the national championship or who knows where that line will be. Maybe it'll be the struggle to make it to the, even make it to the semifinal. But I would think in that, you know, that scenario, if that's what the program is, you make the playoff eight out of 10 years, you make it to the semifinals two or three times. Maybe you give yourself a run at, at a national champion or, you know, making it to a national championship game and you give yourself a puncher's chance one year. Yeah. To me, you, you absolutely sign up for that. And maybe in 20, 20 for 34, if you can't get over that hump and you have some lean years, you say, all right, let's look to make a change. But I think in that case, you're one of the best at worst four programs in the SEC, and you're going to be giving yourself a puncher's chance every single season. After where the program has been in the last 15 years, I don't know how, how you wouldn't sign up for that. What do you think, Jack? Yeah. Um, considering the amount of down years Tennessee has had in the past decade, I think he would take that all day. That That's consistently winning a lot of games. Mm. And that's something Tennessee has not been able to do in 20 years. Yeah. Consistent so, relevance. Yeah, consistent relevance. So uh, I'm I, if I'm a Tennessee fan, I'm taking that all day. And consistent, just good quarterback play, I think is the most important part of this. Yeah, is like the underrated part of Lincoln guys. that people were so hard and I'm like, he just had another high zone quarterback. Like it's I don't three, like yeah. people are so hard on the Alex Grinch stuff and his commitment to him as his DC and like the tackling and like what that, but I'm like, he's still one of the five best coaches in college football. Like Lincoln Riley is still someone like South Carolina fans or Florida fans or anyone who dunks on Lincoln Riley. I'm like, you would sign up for Lincoln Riley in a heartbeat. Lincoln Riley. Um, look at Sooner fans this year with Brent Venables this past year. Like, look at the question marks there. Like, Lincoln, it's not just plug and play uh, in Norman, it turns out. Like, Lincoln's a pretty good coach, and Lincoln is a pretty good uh, pretty good offensive mind still today. And I think if you could build that at Tennessee, I think, with a little bit more upside on defense, I think we've seen a little bit more um, on the defensive side of the ball. And I think Tim Banks is a much better defensive coordinator than Alex Grinch to this point. And I think the run defense was really good for Tennessee this past year. They showed they can do that. It's a bend, don't break. It's how they do, handle the red zone, how they handle uh, just being on the field a bunch. They rotate really well. They're going to have more talent, I think, than Oklahoma could have had on the defensive side of the ball. Like Ryan said, with just how they recruited that side this past year, I think there's more optimism on that front. But I think the main thing is, like, if you have enough, if Hypo is going to develop good quarterback after good quarterback, you sign up for that for a decade, like decade plus. Like, that. that's just really hard to find those guys where they're the quarterback whisperer type where it's like, you know what's fun? having a good offense or a really good quarterback in today's game. Like if you have a good quarterback, you're going to feel like you're in it every single season. So if you go from Hendon to Joe for a year to Nico to the next guy, a four star who may not have the same kind of upside of Nico, but you're like, Oh, probably pretty good. Like, and then maybe like with some grad transfers sprinkled in with the magical years, like the Hendon hooker types, you'll take that 10 times out of 10 because we, as like the three of us have watched a lot of Tennessee football over the years and, this era and like how much fun it is for folks to just watch the points and watch the high octane offense. I think uh, it's a lot of fun to win this way and to play football this way. A hundred percent. And I think a lot of what you just said is why 
I don't worry about like the UConn game, and UTSA is good enough. Again, eat. I'm not saying I'm worried about the UConn game. I'm saying it's a tougher schedule than last year because the, you're plugging in UConn for like um, Tennessee Akron. Martin, like UT Martin. Akron, yeah, their layups or are, Akron, yeah, yeah, yeah. Their layups yeah. are way easier, Ryan. You can't deny that. I mean, yeah. no, no, they are. But my whole yeah. point is, not Jeremy Pruitt. Mm. going to score 40 to 50 points in those games, yeah. and they're not going to lose them. This is not Jeremy Pruitt when they're beating Charlotte 17 to three, and you're holding on for dear life. Like, I'm, I'm just saying they have to. They can't walk through them. That you cannot. You cannot just zombie your way through those games. Like, I don't think they really have Austin P as the only one where it's like we can play our player backups. Like, this is going to be a Nico snap game. Like, that's it for Nico, guaranteed for him this year. They can zombie their way to a 35-24 win against UConn. I don't think so. Sorry, sorry. Sorry, Jim Mora. Sorry, I'm not scared of UConn. Sorry, <laughs> We're not scared. Think... There's a middle ground here, Ryan. They have to play. Like, UConn is a competent football team. They have to be ready to play. It's not Ball State coming in there. Like, it's just not. It's not Ball State, and Tennessee mm-hmm. won that game by 60 points. I know. So, <laughs> there's a middle ground, and the middle ground is Tennessee winning by 30. So, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time in the offseason thinking about UConn. Wow. Ryan sue Shumper. me. Sue me, Jim Mora. <laughs> Not a puppy. Sorry, fan. Jim Mora. I'm sorry. Okay, Ryan has spoken, Jack. Ryan is not Andrew. scared of you. We are on the same page though about UTSA, where I'm yeah. just I'm I'm ready for that one. The building is yeah. going to be walking on eggshells when UTSA is going 35 to 31 in Neyland, and all the jokes on Twitter is like, is Tennessee about to drop this to UTSA? Is that what's happening? Um, because that's that's going to be a back and forth game. Is Vanderbilt their uh, third easiest game this year? Ooh. Uh... No. Virginia or Vanderbilt? Because I think UTSA is better than Virginia. Yeah. I yes, I think UTSA is better than both of them. Right. Yeah. I would go Vanderbilt third, third easiest game. Then Virginia four, UTSA five, Missouri I think six. South Carolina at home is in the top four. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I mean, there's no doubt. Like, it's 65-7. Like, and I'm going to be... I uh, I should just record myself all that Saturday, like me walking around Neil and finding any South Carolina fan where it's like you'll pay for your crimes and it's, just like uh, it's gonna Chase, be a lot of fun walking Chase around. Chase is gonna be like the Scott Cochran video in Alabama. It's <laughs> gonna be like forty nine to seven Tennessee in the second half, and Chase is gonna be a section F of the stadium just going smash him, smash him, smash him, smash him. <laughs> that is that is gonna be Chase when one hundred percent. That is gonna be me. Um, they make me so mad. The fan base that drives me nuts. Like they're going five and seven this year. Back up. Um, <laughs> last thing, Tennessee basketball. So they lost uh, at Florida, uh, a trend like uh, any other for Tennessee. Usually, just in the football capacity, they go to Gainesville and lose. And it's another loss where they just could not score at all. Ziegler giveth, Ziegler taketh with some turnovers, some shots that just were not going in. But then he would come come back around with some awesome steals and. He does a lot. Like he was pulled a couple times angrily by Rick Barnes, but um, besides Jordan James couldn't hit anything. Vescovy couldn't hit anything. Um, it was just not their night um, in a lot of ways. But why, in your estimation, did Florida end up beating Tennessee they, the way they did, Jack? Yeah, I, and Ryan has said this multiple, multiple times again. But when Tennessee can't shoot and they can't drive, this is what happens. And your margin for error on defense is so, so small. Mm. And, you know, Florida had two kill shots, which is a 10-0 run in this game. Granted, you know, the first one, Tennessee's offense did them zero favors. So a lot of that is on Tennessee's offense. But late, when Tennessee takes a six-point lead with 10 minutes to go, if you're a top-two team in the nation, you're supposed to be able to finish that out. And they just couldn't do that. Florida goes on a 29-10 to run to end the game. And that that's that's was the difference of the game. That right there. I, I'm, I don't care about the 17 to four run to start the game. I mean, yeah, 13 points was the win margin, and that was a 13 point lead to, to come out of the gate. But allowing that six point lead to evaporate there in the last 10 minutes was the reason Tennessee wasn't able to hold on. And a cold offensive night, um, you know, in all areas, coupled with the defense not playing their most elite level, this is going to happen. What do you think, Ryan? I think they lost the way they did because, you know, by 13 points, because the defense collapsed. I mean, it was yeah. unbelievably uncharacteristic. I I blocked out so much of the Colorado game. It was so long ago from my mind. But 
no way. I mean, Tennessee's defense in the last 10 minutes, I can't imagine it's been worse in a long, long time. I mean, mm. just obviously Castleton dominated in the combination of Campbell and Plossic, but the bad rotations, the bad transition defense, so that's why they lost the way they did. The, way, the reason it was close, the reason they had a chance to lose is it goes back to the offense. And I think with this core, when you're two senior leaders who you rely on, who are no doubt good players, when they score the vast majority of their points on jump shots, you're just going to have nights like this. And they've never been able to get consistency from Olivier Kamwa and Yuris Plasic. It would be dumb to expect it now, in my opinion. And I think in a lot of games, the guy Ziegler can bail them out. He is the guy who can get to the basket. I think, one, it's a bad matchup because Colin Castleton's a phenomenal inside defender. And really, I like I like Florida's game plan of, all right, we're going to run often. We're going to go over to screens. Don't let Ziegler shoot the threes, but we're going to let him shoot the mid-range jump shots. And I think he missed a couple early, and his confidence was a little bit shaken. And the, what Castleton was able to do to take him away at the basket, and combined with the fact that the shooters were not hitting shots. And I think in some of these games, you saw it in Mississippi State in the first half when Vescovy and uh, Key were out. I think Ziegler presses a little bit. He feels like he has to do a lot. And granted, he does have to do a lot, but he gets he plays a little bit out of himself. And I think you saw that at stretches in this game. And to me, there's more answers to – there's more offensive answers this season when they miss shots. I wrote about this the other night. It, it – the the scoring droughts, as much as the fans want to act like it's the same as last year, it's not. I mean, they, they've had much, much, much less of them. And it's even under the national average on the four-plus-minute scoring droughts. Now, granted, they had three of them in, in the Florida game, and it was it was really, really bad. They have more answers, but there's not a consistent one you can you know is going to be there every single night. I think Ziegler's probably getting to the basket is probably the best one, the most consistent one. But it isn't. You're not going to get it night in and night out. And I think if Tennessee is truly going to answer that question and have – enough answers that you feel really good going into the NCAA tournament. It's going to be Julian Phillips turning, turning a page and hitting another gear because he has that athleticism. He has that length and he has more than anybody else on Tennessee's team and ability to get to the free throw line, which I, I think is obviously really important in games when you're not shooting it well. My thing is, can Drew Pimberg come back for the <laughs> tournament? Can we get him back for the tourney? Pick and pop I threes. saw a projection first round game last week, UNC Asheville, Tennessee. Oh my god. That would be something. That would be something. I he still is... don't I've I've thought about this a lot since Drew Pember's unbelievable performance. I guess that was last middle of last week. Mm. I still don't think it would work at Tennessee. I just don't. I think Rick Parts would get so mad at the defensive the defensive issues that he wouldn't trust him enough. And right now in not to say that he couldn't have success and couldn't score a lot of points at Tennessee. It's get it's the I can't remember the Michael Jordan coach before Phil Jackson. It's Get the ball to Drew and get out of the way at UNC Asheville right now. And that's never how it's going to be at Tennessee. I don't know. But... He's going to pick and pop three. Like, he's in the corner. Yeah. He's at the top of the key. Like, I don't know. Those shots, like, I Tennessee doesn't have a big who can shoot like Drew. Yes. But Rick Barnes will take the defense over to yeah. shooting. Yeah. But it's like, well, then some things are going to happen where Tennessee fans are going to be on just uh, just unnerved when the, you don't have guys like that. Like, the five-out basketball at UNC Asheville plays, like, when you're playing small like Tennessee does, like, they still have four non shoot They have four shooters in the court and not five. Like, there's stretches with UNC Asheville where it's just five shooters. Like, there's never going to be a scenario where there's five shooters that you're confident in for Tennessee with this group. Yeah, but it's not like it's Euros out there. Someone yeah. who can't shoot. I mean, Olivier, he had a three the other night. He yeah. keeps, he's, he can shoot enough to keep people honest. I'm trying mm. to find the numbers right here. He's made, he made 13 threes last year. He's made nine this year. Again, he's not a great shooter, but yeah. he does enough that you have to respect him, and he, he's pretty good at that top of the key shot. And again, no Drew Pember. It's, it's who Rick Barnes. It's who Rick Barnes is. Like you're not going to change it. No. And his priorities are going to be what his priorities are, and you should recruit. You should put the roster together together to those priorities, not what you want to see. Which I mean, I get that's probably frustrating for Tennessee fans, especially when they get to watch Josh Eiffel's offense all fall. Yeah, I don't think that helps. Um, well, in this, uh, final predictions on Auburn uh, tomorrow. How do you think it goes? Does Tennessee win? And what is the score, Jack? Yeah, Tennessee wins. Uh, good okay. bounce back win. Um, defense plays well. Kai Ziegler continues to roll. I know on the stat sheet it wasn't the best night, but I didn't think he played that bad against Florida. I thought he was one of the bright spots you know, here and there for Tennessee, so I think he has another great game. 
And I, Tennessee wins by, I'm going to say by double digits. You know, I was I was hovering around the six to seven point win range for the Texas game. And they, you know, it should have been a 15 point win. So I'll say they beat Auburn by around 12. Okay. What about you, Ryan? I'll say maybe like a 68-60. I think Bruce Pearl always seems to have good defensive plans to come in and play Tennessee. And I, I think he'll have that uh, against Tennessee on Saturday. So I don't foresee a Tennessee game where they just go off offensively. But I look at Auburn's roster and I don't see how to score enough. I don't see how to, yeah. I don't see how to score enough to win in Knoxville. Yeah. We'll see when we go down the road in Auburn. To, to Challenge accepted, season. said the Tennessee Auburn offense. may not get out of the 50s. It could be like 71 to 58 or something like that. Yeah. That'd I would nice. I would set the over under for Auburn points. Yeah, I really would. I mm. I I think Tennessee's backcourt is significantly significantly better. Obviously Auburn has figured out some things over the course of the season they've gotten better, but also have seen how important Jabari Smith was to that team last year and how much they leaned on him and how much better they would have been if Katie Johnson and Wendell Green weren't addicted to shooting the ball and got the ball to their best player in crunch time a lot more. Well, before crunch time, I should say. And how many games last how many games last year against average teams was Auburn down by they would fiddle their thumbs for thirty five minutes and they would be down by five and I said, All right, Jamari, go win the game for us and Jamari was usually good enough to do it. But it's it's I'm a I'm a big Bruce Pearl fan. I think he's a great coach. Last year was the worst coaching job in his in, in at least since he's been at Tennessee, since I've been following it. I, and obviously it's a crazy thing to say. He got the team number one. They had a tremendous amount of respect or a tre- tremendous amount of success. But, man, they leaned on those guards too much. He gave them too much leeway. and They got into the NCAA tournament. And they got absolutely ran because they had too much trust in those gar- guards. And Miami put them in an absolutely blender, an absolute blender and dominated them. Uh, I think Tennessee's guards have the ability to do the same thing on Saturday. There you go. Ryan, we'll get a good check out from you and the team over at Rocky Top Insider this week. Yeah, plenty of stuff. Uh, I had two pieces. Looking at the basketball game, one kind of looking more macro at the offensive issues Tennessee has and how they're better, but there are still a cost for concern. And then I had another one kind of looking at, Jack mentioned it, Tennessee went up by six with 1040 on the road. Great teams win, really good teams win that game. And to me, that was a little worrisome for the veteran group uh, that Tennessee has. So stuff on that. Well, I'll have plenty more looking ahead to Auburn and uh, ton. We have stuff on the, I already for- forgot how to pronounce his name. Jack helped me the new tight ends coach. Oh, Alec Ablin. Ablin. Alec Ablin. We have stuff on, on that hire. Other uh, plenty of stuff in the, the senior bowl this week is Darnell Wright, Byron Young and uh, Hinton Hooker down there. And we'll be getting you ready for Tennessee baseball as they, I guess two weeks from today, they, uh, First pitch out in Arizona, so uh, we'll have tons of stuff getting you ready for that in the next couple weeks. Yeah, stop going to games. Uh, hey, folks, um, I'm not a graduate student at UT anymore, so I need <laughs> you to keep your ass at home so I can go to Tennessee baseball games as much as I want to and not go bankrupt. So um, stop it. That's uh, that's that's my my take is stop it until the tickets are down. Until I'm okay, I need you to stop it. Just check with me. Uh, twitter.com slash chase double, double underscore thomas like just check with me before you keep filling up and buying all these tickets like alabama and AM and stuff like let's let's settle down like let, let's settle down here because uh this is a little concerning for me uh jack what about you what can you plug as we wrap up here tonight uh yeah just more uh rocky top insider content um I'll, ryan and i'll be in the house for the auburn game tomorrow so that'll be fun um wrote about Hinden hooker talking to the titans that was the first thing he talked to so maybe and then Hooker's a future Titan. We'll see. But, uh, yeah, so tons of stuff over at Rocky Top Insider. Of course, I'm still helping produce Always College Football with Greg McElroy, Monday, Wednesday, Fridays on ESPN College Football YouTube, Apple, and Spotify. So be sure and check that out as well. There you go. Uh, the preferred podcast of, uh, of Always College Football, the Chase Thomas Podcast. That's what many are saying. Um, Jack, Ryan, thank you as always. And I'll talk to you all both very soon. Done.